Tech IT is the expert go-to resource for all things CMMC. Education, certification, preparation, and ongoing managed IT. Manage, secure, grow. Check it out at snaptechit.com. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of 123 CMMC. My name is Dana Mantilla. I will be your host today. And our guest is the ever so lovely Carl Bickmore back again. Hello, Carl, how are you? Oh man, ever so lovely, my word. <laughs> <laughs> we have an exciting topic today. We're gonna to talk about the top five best practices for aerospace and manufacturing preparing for CMMC. So take it away. Well, great, uh, look, there's uh, some things that we're seeing as trends as we're working with aerospace industry folks that we just thought we would throw out there that are common. They're very, many of them are very basic. Uh, look, when you're looking to get CMMC certified, there's uh, the original 17 controls of level one. And these are things that we're commonly seeing as things that need to be improved or that are commonly done. So I, I you know, the first thing I would say is that we need to look at authentication controls uh, the second is we need to think about threat detection and understanding what that is. Uh, we also need to look at um, how remote access or remote desktop is being done. Um, and then the last, or then we also have uh, uh, end user awareness training. And then the last one would be um, how to do better with your risk security management, your policy creation, so forth. So, so those are the five areas that we see as like common areas where you could do some simple things to get moving forward and have a better expectation and really, really make some headway, common misses we see. So these are best practices that I feel like we could talk about that might help any organization looking to become CMMC, but specifically in aerospace manufacturers, we see these as common things. Okay, all right, we'll dive right in. So why is it important to upgrade authentication controls? Ah, yes, well, okay, so the authentication control issue, we see a couple of things commonly. One is that um, you have a lot of equipment that has embedded OS uh, or uh, time clock machines and various things out on the manufacturing floor where shared accounts are used, uh, where, you know, everybody just kind of walks up and hits enter and goes, or they everybody knows the same password. Or uh, just in general, there are ways of getting into the system from public side, or even if it's just into email, where things like multi-factor authentication isn't in use. And so uh, these are both requirements for uh, CMMC, but I'm telling you, they're also really good just to make sure you don't get hacked or you don't have a problem with ransomware or something like that. We make this recommendation to any company, but it is also required for CMMC. So at the beginning, you need to make sure that you're not using shared accounts uh, and there's strategies and ways of going about improving that. Uh, uh, but mostly it involves using some type of directory system like Active Directory or Azure Active Directory. Um, and uh, then after that, making sure you're turning on multi-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks will get like migrated to Office 365, which is a great service, but it's not configured for security. Uh, and that uh, that's a pretty big miss. And so these are simple things you can get to. And, you know, to be perfectly frank, you know, as you progress through the various levels of CMMC, you need to address this at level one. And then it needs to be addressed even more specifically with documented policies as you get into level two and level three. And most folks we're talking to seems to be heading toward level three is what they're going to need to do. So this is just an area you need to work on. That was a good point about the whole, you know, everybody, the time clock, because I, I bet you're right. I, I would say probably most organizations, everybody either has the same code or knows the same code or, you know, that kind of thing. So that, Yeah, I mean, it's it's example. usually running off of a computer, right? And uh, they don't want people to have to bother with individual logins. There's other ways to attack, uh, attack that, like with a kiosk type install or just different ways of doing it that uh, can do that. Well, that's just one we've seen at a lot of clients. Yeah, so. yeah I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay, so how does installing threat detection catch the threats that firewalls can miss? Oh yeah, well, okay, so let me set the stage for this a little bit better because people would be like, wow, threat detection, what did that just mean? And don't I already have it? I mean, doesn't my firewall detect threats? You know, I think one of the fundamental things when you look at CMMC and the categories or the NIST controls that originally was born out of with some enhancements and improvements as it's gone, there, there are five areas. There's how to identify your your uh, um, your IT assets and your uh, security procedures. There's how to protect them. There's how to detect 
uh, things are going on, respond and recover. And and uh, I think a lot of folks, when they're not in IT, or to be honest, a lot of IT folks don't even understand the difference between protection and detection. And so the analogy I like to use is a firewall is like locking the door for your, your building, and it's great protection and it keeps things out. But uh, as you and I both know, a door can be gotten around. Maybe there's another door that they find or a window they get through, or maybe the door got locked over. Maybe somebody followed somebody in. And so you need this thing that detects what just went through the door and looks to see if it was a bad guy, you know, per se. And so um, not only do you need to have good protection, like good antivirus uh, endpoint protection, you need to have um, good uh, firewalls that are controlled and set up in a, in a secure way. You also need outside of the firewall, something to look and see things that are going on inside the network that can detect threats that made it through. Very much like an alarm system for a building can tell you, hey, I just had motion in this room. Uh, somebody made it through the door, you know? And, and so it's just a, um, a part of the process of understanding that most organizations that are small business have absolutely no threat detection in place. Um, and uh, they have good protection things, or at least the basics often. It's rare I find an organization that doesn't have a firewall. Maybe it's not configured securely, but they have something. Um, but very few actually have detection in place. And I'll tell you, if, if your IT team says, well, you have this good antivirus program, that is not threat detection. That is a protection tool. Uh, and you need something to check if your antivirus program didn't work or your firewall didn't work. And there's a whole category. In fact, oftentimes you'll, you'll hear, hear this referred to in the industry as managed detection and response or MDR or at least EDR capabilities and IT people sit there and manage it. So anyway, threat detection is uh, an important category most people don't understand and having a firewall and antivirus alone is not threat detection. So it's good. So you look at it as protecting and detecting, two separate things that like exactly. said, most people are not separating that. And most. Uh, yeah, they don't understand the difference. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Certainly people that aren't IT people, but it's shocking how many IT people don't understand the difference either. Hmm. That's not good. Okay. <laughs> Why should you stop opening remote desktop to anyone on the internet? <laughs> well, remote access is interesting. A lot of firms, uh, a lot of companies that uh, that I talk to in aerospace manufacturing, they actually like just go like, we just don't do remote access because it's too dangerous, too, too much risk. And, you know, that's not a bad answer. But a lot of times you'll find that there is a person or two that has remote access or there are companies that don't ban 100% and they do it. And then they, what they do is they they kind of use like uh, old school methodologies, like just opening ports on firewalls, and allowing people into remote desktop to computers or terminal servers or RDP, as it's oftentimes called RDP session. Remote desktop. This is um, probably the number one high risk thing that you should probably consider eliminating from your practice. RDP open to the public, passing through the firewall from anywhere on the Internet is a highly risky way to approach uh, remote access. Now you can use remote desktop, but you need to put it behind, behind the firewall, behind a good solid VPN multi-factor authenticated setup or a zero trust networking access ZTNA solution. You simply can't just open it wide to the public. In fact, you should really open nothing wide to the public, especially remote desktop. But that one is particularly good to highlight because we see it all the time in use and we see it used in very dangerous ways. And frankly, I, uh, when we have been brought in to help with incident responses after a company has been compromised, it is often the reason that that compromise happened, that their ransomware event occurred is because there was an open port and it connected to the remote desktop service, which is easily exploited. Well, and, you know, I think also when, you know, when COVID happened and everybody got sent home and maybe they had to set up some kind of shift connection so people could could get back in. Maybe they never really went back afterwards and said, let's look at all this stuff now that we have a minute here to make sure that everything is secure. So that's probably. Yeah, great, thing. great insight. Of course, the suddenly working from home thing did not help the situation of people putting out insecure setups. And you're absolutely right. Plenty have never returned back. And you know what? And plenty have regretted it because they've been hit by that being open. And so it's just one of these things that you just, if you don't know anything about IT, just learn to say, do I have any ports open what, to the internet? And are we using a remote desktop? And is it wide open? And uh, if the answer is ever yes to that, you really want to fix that quick. It's very risky. Good advice. All right. So next, 
how does requiring end user awareness training help the aerospace and manufacturing workforces protect the organization? Yeah, this is a good best practice to think about. One of the, you know, obviously one of the top five. Uh, look, the thing is, is you can put all the protection and detection in place you want, but uh, a determined user, perhaps one that may not be informed or savvy, can typically get around them, um, at least some in some ways, uh, by answering the wrong email, clicking on the wrong link. Uh, there are just things that can happen uh, because the end user uh, has not been well trained. And for years, uh, you know, well, look, aerospace manufacturers are used to training their employees. They're used to training on process and system, how to work within their uh, ERP tools to, you know, manage the workflow on the floor of production. These are normal things. Uh, and sometimes I think they take the same kind of approach to uh, IT stuff uh, or uh, information security in that they'll train them maybe when they get hired, maybe once a year or something like that. And then some kind of company meeting. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I would say that what you have to remember your goal with end user training should be keeping users up to date and making sure that they're thoroughly aware of the risks that the IT services that they consume can and can introduce and what those rules and regulations are. So not only should you be doing end user awareness training, but you should be doing it with expertise. And look, there are some really great programs you can sign up for that help you send the training out, quizzes the end user on what they did, even send simulated tests to them to see how they respond. And they're just not as expensive as like hiring a consultant to come in and do this all the time. And so there's some really great tools out there that have made this more affordable and easily more easily reported on. But the reality of it is, is you're you're only as good as your weakest leg. And if your people that are using your computer systems uh, can't really discern like a phishing email from a regular email easily or they, you know, behave poorly by the searches they conduct on a computer and the things that they're willing to click on or finding random USB drives in the parking lot. You know, <laughs> it, 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 there's all the things that can happen. You just, they just need to be aware. They need training. And I'm frankly, when it comes to the compliance side of it, it needs to be on a schedule, planned, documented, reported on and controlled with audit. So the, it, it's, it's much easier than it used to be. And don't skip the importance of thinking, all oh, my people are savvy, you know, maybe my, my computer users are just engineers, they're smart. In my experience, everybody can benefit. I know we certainly send it to all of our IT people. And if our people need it, I would say and they're as savvy in IT, you know, as anybody, I would think anybody could use it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And continual, continual, continual. It's always got to be at the forefront of our thought process. So that's very yeah. Good. Yeah, there's something psychological about sending out simulation tests to them, too, and seeing how they respond, because, it, you know, sometimes they're even more motivated to not be caught and, and follow up with their manager on a simulation than they are for an actual spear phishing mm -hmm. attempt. You know, it's just nobody wants that, uh, that peer yeah. pressure. <laughs> That's for sure. All right. What additional tips can you provide to aerospace and manufacturing facilities as they embark on their very, very, very long list of CMMC requirements? Well, I'd say one, take a big breath. Uh, you know, it, it, there's still things developing on it. There are still things that need to be done, but there are certainly things you can attack right away that are good business practice to begin with. And uh, uh, the audits are now coming out and there's policies to be made. Uh, there's plenty of areas that you can develop over time. In fact, I think the biggest thing is don't think of this as something like you're going to set up a three month project and be done. Spend your time to plan it. Spend your time to create the documentation. Figure out how you want to approach it and then create a, a, a multi-year plan that's going to get you there in a time frame. You know, remember to ask your prime subcontractors what timetable they're working on and so that you can align with your primary customers on what they, how they might be approaching it. Um, and, and just realize it's not, not something you do all at once, but if you have vigilance and regular discipline towards it, you can really put yourself in good shape um, by the time that this is going to become very important to be done and uh, where contract restrictions will, will become more prevalent and more problem and, and the ability to gain customers and, and to be on contracts will be, will be governed uh, by this. It's already happening. It's just going to grow, but it's not an emergency and you don't need to shove it all in at once. In fact, that would be impractical. So, you know, I, I like the mantra of change 1% a day, you know, to find, find a path and just keep working on it over, over uh, probably a couple of years. 
That, that's a good one. I like that one one percent a day. That's a very good idea because this there is a lot of stuff, and the sooner you get started, the easier it's going to be to digest and get through, as opposed to waiting until you get that contract that says you have to have this, and then I think it's going to be too late. You're not going to be able to get it done in time. Yeah, I mean, look, it's better to be proactive about anything. Obviously, in fact, there there does seem to be. Um, some of our customers are already indicating early mover advantage where they're seeing better looks at contracts and more opportunity because they're already uh, working on it ahead of the game. And look, you know, um, it, it's like anything else in life. You, you know, the more uh, you focus on it and the more you feed that, that process, the better it will grow. The, the, the sooner you get to it, the more the people that require it of you will be happy with it and be able to provide more opportunity. It's both a defense and an offense. You know, you need to be there to not be excluded. Um, you also could be who would be behooved to uh, to get ahead of the game and perhaps get some early mover advantage out of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this is very, very helpful. Thank you, Carl, for all of your excellent information. Is there anything you want to throw out there before we go? Oh, you know, like always, um, snaptechit.com slash resources. We have blogs, articles, white papers, all things around CMMC and just general IT best practices. So feel free to check that out. And, uh, you know, look, if you guys uh, ever have any questions, you can engage us there. And we're happy to, to sit down and have a conversation about specific things that uh, anybody's interested in knowing. And I love on your website how you have that little educational section. That's fantastic. Well, you know, uh, we have a belief that uh, if we can become the source of good education and good information, it it, it, it ra raises the boats for everybody. Like the t rising tide raises all boats, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that uh, the more people use us, you know, maybe perhaps they'll want to engage us for business as well. I just believe that in that philosophy. Like we're not out there to push and sell. Let's just educate, and the and things will come as as they make sense. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for all of your time. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for watching. We will Very see good. you in the next one. Bye, Carl. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Snaptech IT is the expert go-to resource for all things CMMC. Education, certification, preparation, and ongoing managed IT. Manage, secure, grow. Check it out at snaptechit.com.